Why is the dating of the book of Revelation so important? Most believers have not put much thought to the dating of the book of Revelation. Churches in the modern day predominantly teach that it was written around 95 AD after the destruction of Jerusalem, supporting the dispensationalist view where Revelation is believed to speak of future events. However, there is another school of thought that leans to the book being written at the early date of around 65 AD. This is a less popular narrative today, and yet it was the predominant belief of the early church. And this means that the book of Revelation was written before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, during the reign of the Emperor Nero, and that the prophesied events were fulfilled when the second temple was destroyed. This changes our entire outlook on the book of Revelation. Chapters 1 to 19 now appear to have already been fulfilled. The tribulation was already experienced by the hard-hearted Jews who rejected Jesus. The book of Revelation reveals the end of an era while introducing the new. All brought about by the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hence, it is his testimony. It's so important to know the dating of the book of Revelation. This topic has never come to my attention prior, but now I see that it really is the key. Because first of all, it's the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we should seek to understand what he is sharing here because we can't be sloppy around it and we can't overlook it and be casual in any way. We need to diligently hearken to his words. The key here is that if you understand it to be written in 95 AD, as opposed to 65 or so AD, it changes your interpretation of what he's saying. And I've come to see, and after all the research we've both done, I've done, I absolutely do believe it was written at an earlier date. And I've got so much information to give you that compelling information that, that uh, confirms that. And in fact, the early church was under the same belief. The Epistle of Barnabas was written in 100 AD. Although it's not part of the canon, it is a highly regarded extra-biblical text. And it sets forth the commonly held view of the early church that the 70th week of Daniel ended with the destruction of Herod's temple in 70 AD. Hence, the last days described in the book of Revelation occurred in the first century and were not some future event. The Epistle of Barnabas uses the word week to refer to Daniel's 70th week, as this was a very widely known concept and it was popularly discussed at the time. And so the Epistle of Barnabas confirms that when the week is completed, a new temple shall be built in the name of the Lord, a temple not built by man. Instead, it would be made and finished by God, a spiritual temple with Jesus as its cornerstone. The mention of this new form of a temple reveals the perception that the destruction of Herod's temple was the end of the Jewish age also known as the end of the Old Covenant Age. Meanwhile, it was the dawning of the Messiah's day. This thinking opposes modern-day dispensationalism that teaches that there are two separate divine programs, one for Israel and one for the church. Because the Epistle of Barnabas refers to only one covenant following AD 70. And that covenant is rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. The Epistle of Barnabas 16, 6 to 9. But let us inquire whether there be any temple of God. There is, in the place where he himself undertakes to make and finish it. For it is written, and it shall come to pass, when the week is being accomplished, the temple of God shall be built gloriously in the name of the Lord. I find then that there is a temple. How 
then shall it be built in the name of the Lord? Understand ye, before we believed on God, the abode of our heart was corrupt and weak, a temple truly built by hands. For it was full of idolatry and was a house of demons, because we did whatsoever was contrary to God. But it shall be built in the name of the Lord. Give heed then that the temple of the Lord may be built gloriously. How understand ye by receiving the remission of our sins and hoping on the name we became new, created afresh from the beginning, wherefore God dwelleth truly in our habitation within us. How the word of his faith, the calling of his promise, the wisdom of the ordinances, the commandments of the teaching, he himself prophesying in us, he himself dwelling in us, opening for us who had been in bondage unto death, the door of the temple, which is the mouth, and giving us repentance, leadeth us to the incorruptible temple. I quote an article from the website earlychristianhistory.net on the epistle of Barnabas. It states, as is found in a number of Christian works near the end of his diatribe about how the Jews wander in error and refuse to adapt to the new covenant. Barnabas blames them for their defeat at the hands of the Romans and the destruction of their temple that they insidiously refused to let go of. This was predicted, he states, by their own scripture, very loosely citing first Enoch. For the scripture saith, and it shall come to pass in the last days, that the Lord will deliver up the sheep of his pasture and their sheepfold and tower to destruction. The reference is to 1st Enoch 89, 51-57. In other words, as Barnabas sees it, the Jews had plenty of warning, but still they persisted in their error and rejection of God's new covenant. We also have Origen, the early Christian scholar from 185 to 254 AD. A student of Clement of Alexandria, Origen agreed that the destruction of the temple by the Romans in AD 70 marked the end of the Jewish age and the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy regarding the 70 weeks. Origen writes, the weeks of years up to the time of Christ, the leader that Daniel the prophet predicted were fulfilled. Like Clement of Alexandria, Origen also believed the Jewish age, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, and the great tribulation were behind the church, not ahead of it. Then there is Tertullian of Carthage. In AD 203, Tertullian wrote his famous treatise against the Jews. This early church father also taught that Daniel's 70th week had been fulfilled in AD 70. He writes, Vespasian vanquished the Jews, and so by the date of the storming of Jerusalem, the Jews had completed the 70 weeks foretold by Daniel. Contrary to modern postponement preachers and teachers, Tertullian believed the Jewish age, the abomination of desolation, and the great tribulation was behind not ahead of the church. Athanasius was Bishop of Alexandria from 326 to 373 AD. Like the early church fathers before him, he also taught that the 70 weeks of Daniel culminated and the Jewish age ended in AD 70. He wrote, Jerusalem is to stand till his coming. Daniel's reference to Messiah's appearing in his first advent. And thenceforth, prophet and vision cease in Israel, the end of the old covenant or Jewish age. This is why Jerusalem stood till then, that they might be exercised in the types as a preparation for the reality. 
But from that time forth, all prophecy is sealed and the city and temple taken. Athanasius clearly reflects the view of the entire early church. Once the Messiah had come, the role of the temple in Jerusalem would be ended. He wrote, Things to be done which belong to Jerusalem beneath were fulfilled, and those which belong to the shadows had passed away. This important early church father clearly believed that the Jewish age ended in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. From the beginning of Christianity until the 19th century, it was taught predominantly that the book of Revelation was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. It was only from the 20th century onwards that the predominant teaching changed to that of a later date. And how did it change? The main bit of evidence was the writing of Irenaeus. And he has just this one short paragraph in his book Against Heresies, where he is advising the people not to try and determine the name of the Antichrist. And that was his subject. Irenaeus, in the book Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 30, we will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of Antichrist. For if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision. For that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our day, towards the end of Domitian's reign. What has caused confusion is that Irenaeus used the verb that. And the word that in Greek can refer to either he was seen or it was seen. So he could be saying John was seen or the vision was seen. He's not talking about the dating of Revelation, but he was talking about be wary of naming who's the Antichrist because John has only given us his number but not his exact name because it's not worthy of the Holy Spirit to even utter his name. He was so beastly. <laughs> and true enough, actually, with the understanding of the book of Revelation being written in the early date, around 65 AD, at that time, the culture knew who the beast was because Nero, Kaiser Nero, was also known as the beast. The name The Beast was very fitting for Nero because he was regarded as the most evil man of his time. Let's start from the beginning because when I started seeing that this was written, I believe it was written before 70 AD, now all of a sudden the book of Revelation makes so much sense. And before that it was so abstract, it was so ethereal that I couldn't grasp what is the timing and, and how do I actually interpret this and you have a whole host of interpretations but when you see that it's written before the destruction of Jerusalem and then you see all these compelling confirmations from historians such as Josephus it becomes clear and it's also liberating it's liberating because in the book of Revelation, we are showing the end of an era and the beginning of a new era. The end of the earthly Jerusalem and the beginning of the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, first let's speak about Irenaeus a little bit more. All he wrote was, that was seen. So those who believe in the later date, dispensationalists believe he, he was saying, the vision was seen. But those who believe in the earlier date, we believe he was saying John was seen. Let's look further into the text written by Irenaeus. When he writes, for that was seen, I believe he's referring to John because 
if you look further in the text, he also follows that by saying, but he indicates the number of the name now that when this man comes, we may avoid him being aware who he is. So it appears that he's saying, for John was seen not very long time since, but almost in our day, but John indicates the number of the name now that when this man comes, we may avoid him. The late date for the writing of the book of Revelation is based largely on this ambiguous statement by Irenaeus in around AD 175. And Edward E. Stevens writes, Irenaeus was seemingly ignorant about a lot of things, Neuronic persecution, the death of Paul, Peter, and John, during the Neuronic persecution. He thought Jesus lived to over 40 years of age. He was clueless about the fulfillments at AD 17. Thus, he shows no evidence of having been taught by John or any of the other 12 apostles. So it is no surprise that Irenaeus chronologically misplaced a whole bunch of things, not merely his confusion over Nero versus Domitian. In the same work, Irenaeus spoke of ancient copies of Revelation, which leads to a contradictory conclusion. There's also potential confusion from Irenaeus' reference to Domitian. Domitian was the Roman emperor from AD 81 to 96, but Domitius was also the family name of the emperor Nero. My husband Thomas taught on this writings of Irenaeus. You can watch his segment that's posted on the Cardboard Box Church YouTube channel and it's titled Josephus and the Siege of Jerusalem, Irenaeus and the Book of Revelation. You also have to understand about Irenaeus that he wasn't entirely accurate in his other writings as well. For example, he said that Jesus' ministry lasted for 15 years. <laughs> and he said that Jesus died at age 50. So we know that's not accurate. Now, the reason why this is important is because the understanding of the later date is based on this. It's such a weak standard. It's such a weak source to depend on. But this was used to change the thinking of the church. And in fact, another name that dispensationalists will use to um, contend for the later date is Eusebius. And Eusebius uses the writings of Arrhenius to push forth this theory. Eusebius came later. Arrhenius lived from 120 to 202 AD, which is why his uh, writings are heated because he comes from that early period. And then you have Eusebius he came in 260 to 339 AD. Now he was the Bishop of Caesarea and he had a lot of clout because he wrote about the persecution of the church and he wrote amazing writings and treaties on what the Christians suffered. So he did a great service to the church. However, <laughs> Eusebius also had his weaknesses because he was not a fan of millennialism. And he was loyal to the Roman Empire and to Constantinople. And he believed that God's heavenly kingdom had become manifest in the Roman Empire through Constantine the Great. Eusebius was the spiritual advisor to Constantine, to whom he was loyal and committed. In fact, in his book, The Life of Constantine the Great, it is noted that he put a great emphasis and focus on Constantine's mental and spiritual strength, even his physical strength, and created a portrait of a man who seemed nearly godlike. Eusebius' treatment of Constantine generated much of the controversy surrounding the text because he was seen as being extremely generous in his treatment and it was noted for its less than objective aims. In fact, Timothy Barnes noted that Eusebius clearly omits accounts and information to portray Constantine in a favorable light. 
Eusebius advanced the idea of divine right on Constantine, that he was the emperor due to God's will and was God's imitator on earth. He describes him using a biblical metaphor, painting Constantine in the image of Moses. Eusebius affirmed the new church-state relationship that Constantine had established. He believed the church would establish the kingdom of God through the state. It was this thinking that was antagonistic to the expected kingdom of God because the apostles expressed the faith in a literal millennial restoration of the kingdom. Early Christians had expectations of the kingdom tied to the return of Jesus at the end of the age. Although they believed the kingdom of God was already present, they believed its fulfillment would only be seen with the destruction of the kingdoms of this world. Eusebius sought to brand this thinking as heresy because he was wholly invested as Constantine's spiritual advisor. With the Edict of Milan and the Christianization of the Roman Empire, Eusebius perceived that he was already experiencing the Kingdom of God under Constantine's earthly rule. Therefore, he opposed millennialism and actively discredited the Book of Revelation. He went so far as to claim that Papias was imagining that the millennium was taught by the apostles. He wrote, In these Papias accounts, he says there would be a certain millennium after the resurrection and that there would be a corporeal reign of Christ on this very earth, which things he appears to have imagined as if they were authorized by the apostolic narrations, not understanding correctly those matters which they propounded mystically in their representations. In addition, Eusebius is quoted as saying, it is an act of virtue to deceive and lie when by such means the interests of the church might be promoted. He actually said this. He was willing to deceive and lie in order to promote what he believed was a worthy cause. But this was a very detrimental mindset that he possessed. He was far from unbiased. And he would actually create a tremendous amount of confusion with some of the information, the false information that he put out there. So he was trying to discredit the book of Revelation. And he uses Irenaeus writings to do this. And on top of that, he also claimed that John the Apostle did not write the book of Revelation, that someone else named John, John the Elder, wrote this book. So it's just very questionable because another thing he said was, he said both the Johns, John the Apostle and John the Elder, are, have their graves. They're buried in the church in Ephesus. And that's not true. There was only one grave for John the Apostle. There's not a whole lot of accuracy with both Arrhenius and Eusebius. Eusebius was also excommunicated at a later date because he had some heretical ideas. He didn't believe in the Trinity. He did not believe that Jesus was made of the same substance as God. And he was a proponent of this doctrine called Arianism. I don't consider him a reliable source, although I appreciate his writings on the persecuted church. So he did do a good service as well. It's difficult to come to a conclusion about Eusebius because he was truly passionate about serving Jesus and advancing his kingdom. So I feel I need to assert that despite his failings, his life was a tremendous blessing to the body of Christ. He left a great legacy with his extensive accounts of the first three centuries of Christianity, recording precious testimonies which would otherwise have been lost. He had a great zeal for the Lord. And though I don't agree with all his actions and some of his beliefs, I do feel it's important to acknowledge his many contributions. Now let's turn to Papias. Papias was the bishop of Hierapolis. He lived from 60 AD to 130 AD. Papias was a disciple of the Apostle John, along with his friend Polycarp. 
He knew both personally. And it seems he was quite close to the Apostle John because Irenaeus describes him as a hearer of John. Papias lived in Hierapolis, Turkey, so he lived roughly about a hundred miles away from the Apostle John, who, outside of imprisonment, was based in Ephesus, Turkey, for most part. Let's go on to Papias. Papias was a contemporary of John the Apostle. He actually knew him, he met him, and Papias wrote that John the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation. So he confirms this. There's a lot more information there, but I'm, I'm just going to flip forward. We also have Jerome. He's a fourth century theologian, and he speaks about this appearance that the Apostle John made in 96 AD. And I think this is the appearance that um, Irenaeus was actually referring to because it's the same timing. And Jerome writes that when John appeared in public, at this public appearance, he was so old and so infirm that he was, and I quote his words, with difficulty carried into the church and could only speak a few words to the people. Now, if you consider that this is in 96 AD, and it's believed by dispensationalists that the book of Revelation was written in 95 AD, how would it make sense that Revelation 10, 11 states that John must prophesy again to many people, to kings, etc.? It's not possible given the, the condition he was in. He couldn't even walk on his own. Jerome would also write about John being plunged into boiling oil by the Emperor Nero. He miraculously survived and escaped the experience. Then Jerome writes about John's later appearance in 96 AD, where he is extremely elderly and infirm. And it's been speculated by many that it's difficult to imagine John writing Revelation in AD 96 and then speaking to many nations and kings when he couldn't even converse casually in an ordinary setting. The next external evidence I'll give you is the Syriac Bible. And this is more reliable than any writing from any single person, even from the earliest time. Mm -hmm. Because the Syriac Bible is one of the oldest versions of the Bible. And the oldest version of the Bible actually gives the date of Revelation. The Syriac version of the New Testament which dates back to 2nd century AD, states that Revelation was written during the reign of Nero, making the date anywhere from 64 to 68 AD. That's in the Bible? In the Syriac Bible. The Syriac Bible. I just had to read that. I didn't have to do any of the studying. <laughs> yeah. It's the most I mean, it's the most reliable source. So this is one of the most ancient version, versions and sources of the New Testament that we have available. And it's called the Syriac Peshito, P-E-S-H-I-T-T-O. It holds more weight than any single writer. In fact, there are several textual redactions to consider. We just discussed the Syriac Peshito. To recap, the Syriac version of the New Testament dates back to the 2nd century AD and states that Revelation was written during the reign of Nero, making the date 64 to 68 AD. Secondly, we have the Muratorian fragment that dates back to 170 to 190 AD, it states that this work of John was written during the reign of Nero. A bit of a background on the Muratorian fragment. It's also known as the Canon Muratori. It consists of 85 lines. It is the oldest list of books of the New Testament. The Muratorian Canon AD 170 is the earliest surviving list of canonical books. In this important manuscript, we read the blessed Apostle Paul 
following the rule of his predecessor John, writes to no more than seven churches by name. This demands a dating of John's revelation prior to the time that Paul was beheaded, no later than AD 67 or 68, and probably even earlier than Paul's letters. Thirdly, we have the Aramaic Peshitta version that states that it is dated prior to 70 AD. Lastly, we have the Monarchian Prologues that dates back to 250 to 350 AD. It states that Paul also wrote to these seven churches, possibly Romans, which was a circular letter. It went out to many addresses following John's book, placing the book of Revelation even before some of the other Pauline epistles. I'm referencing an article written by Charles Meek, and he brings up the relevance of the Shepherd of Hamas when it comes to the dating of the Book of Revelation. Why is that? Well, the Shepherd of Hamas is now considered an extra biblical text, but it was actually very well known by early church fathers, and at that time it was often considered canonical. This alone gives away the timing of its composition because only those books written around the apostles time or shortly thereafter would even be considered canonical. Also, it seems that the apostle Paul references the writer of the shepherd of Hermas in Romans 16:14. The shepherd of Hermas draws from the book of Revelation which implies that the book of Revelation must have been written much earlier than AD 95 and probably before AD 70. One of the themes of the Shepherd of Hermas is that it prepares its readers for the coming tribulation and the persecution of Christians. Shepherd of Hermas, chapter 2, 6 to 7. Ye therefore that work righteousness, be steadfast, and be not double-minded, that ye may have admission with the holy angels. Blessed are ye, as many as endure patiently the great tribulation that cometh, and as many as shall not deny their life. When we look at the writings of the early church, there are at least 130 other authors who stated that the book of Revelation was written in the time of Nero before 70 AD, including Clement of Alexandria. He's a very reliable source. He said that the apostles ministry, and that's all the apostles, including John, their ministry ended with Nero. So these are the, these are the other sources we want to look at as opposed to dispensationalism, which is banking on a single paragraph from Irenaeus, which is not even clear what he's saying, because that word used, that can be translated two ways. So let's now go to the internal evidence. And this is so, this is so fascinating. The Lord showed me something incredible that I'll, I'll lead up to. Okay, firstly, the book of Revelation, it starts with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Okay, that word shortly, the word used in Greek is takos. And takos means, according to the Strong's Concordance, swiftness, speed, done as quickly speedily as is appropriate to the particular situation. So the sense of speed. Like the speed at which you eat a taco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I needed that example. Okay. Now we see in the book of Revelation, you're going to see tacos mentioned multiple times. Revelation 1, 1, Revelation 1, 3, Revelation 22, 6. Revelation 22.7, Revelation 22.10, 10, 
Revelation 22, 12, Revelation 22, 20, all these verses speak about the shortness of time, that this is coming swiftly. There's an emphasis that this is around the corner. And we compare that now to the apocalyptic vision given to Daniel, because what we're seeing here is John the Revelator getting a apocalyptic vision, and so did Daniel. But look how they are told to deal with it. In the book of Daniel 12.4, it says, seal up the vision for it is a long way off. You're not going to hear the word tacos being used there. <laughs> but in Revelation 22.10, the scripture says, John was instructed not to seal up the vision for it is not a long way off. It just gets clearer and clearer. You're going to get compounding evidence that this is for a catastrophe that is occurring around the corner. And the Lord, he does not do anything without first showing his servants. And this would be the most cataclysmic, catastrophic event in Jewish History. Yeah. The only comparison you could think of is the parting of the Red Sea. Or the, the, dis the destruction of the temple and, in Babylon. And the destruction of the temple in Babylon. But these three events are held at the highest uh, markers in Jewish history. Now let's also look at the scripture in Revelation 1-7, where the Lord says, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. A lot of people see this and they think that this is a scripture pointing to the second advent of Christ. And also in Revelation 14, 14, where the scripture says, Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Sickle mm -hmm. and judgment. But I want to show you something because the automatic association is that this is the second coming of Christ. But if you look at the scriptures in the Old Testament, for example, the Lord has come in clouds before, but it was not his second coming, obviously. It occurred in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 19.1, the burden against Egypt, behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. This prophecy was given before Egypt was attacked and overwhelmed by the Assyrians. And it was dramatic and it was so volatile that it said that there's no way it could have been averted. There was absolute desolation. The Nile River dried up. There was a drought. The fertile lands turned barren. So the scripture of the Lord coming on clouds occurred then. But nobody actually saw him coming on the clouds. No, no human eye. I don't know. In the spirit, there may have been someone who saw in the spirit. But we don't see any documentation of human eyes seeing this occurring but what we do know is that when the lord comes on clouds there's judgment there's desolation there's a ending of the old and the beginning of a new so we have that in isaiah 19 1. in revelation john gives so many clues to the time that they are in because he speaks of which is a scripture where he talks about the seven kings so we're 17, 11 or 17. Okay, 17, 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. So here it is. The Lord is giving clues to revelation. For the mind that has wisdom, there will be an understanding of this. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. There are seven kings 
five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. So Nero was the sixth king. We begin this from uh, Julius Caesar being the first, because this is how Josephus actually considered Julius Caesar the first Caesar. There are some people who consider first emperor. the he, first Caesar. Yeah, yeah, well, he was Caesar, but he wasn't necessarily considered emperor by, I think, uh, a lot of people, but he was. Doesn't it have the same meaning, Caesar and emperor? Uh, there's some kind of distinction, I think, but uh, but it's the same thing, but it's like a lot of people think that he didn't officially, like he started without him. Oh, right, right, right. I see what but you like mean. the whole emperor thing started like right, right. after him with yes, Augustus. It, yes, the empire began. But it began from the foundation of Julius Caesar. Okay, I get what you're saying. Okay, so because of that, some historians regard Augustus as the first emperor. But if you look at other historians such as Josephus, who's a reliable source who lived during that time. I wouldn't. Yes, he's a living witness. He declares Julius Caesar as the first Caesar. And then if you take that from Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, we have Nero as the sixth Caesar, and then Galba. John makes it very clear who he's referring to. When, If you understand the empires and you look at his scripture, seven kings, five have fallen, one is... One is, the sixth is, he's the emperor of the present time, and that is Nero. That is the emperor who's ruling at the time that he's writing this. And the other has not yet to come. Okay. But when he comes, he's there for a short space, and that was Galba. It was only six months. Yes, Galba was an exception. It was a very short sure. time, exactly as the scripture says. So there's confirmation upon confirmation. And then also, now... John did not give the name Nero. He gave his number 666, 666, because I think most people know that in the Hebrew alphabet, every alphabet is a number as well. And the practice of gematria, they will take names and they will add up the numbers to it and give an appoint a number to a person to understand their destiny. Now with Nero, in Hebrew, he was known as Nero Kaiser. And Nero Kaiser, when you add up the numbers, is it adds up to 666. But then you get the manuscripts where the beast was not numbered 666. He was numbered 616. And guess what? In Latin, if you write the name Nero, it adds up to 616. So it seems to be another clear indication that everyone knows they're talking about Nero. But the name Nero, according to Irenaeus, he won't even utter that name. The Holy Spirit won't even utter that name. If you study the history of Nero, he truly was a beast. He was so cruel. He was so evil. He, he had affairs with everybody, including his mother, and then he killed his mother. He would go out into Rome, and he would rape his people, and he would torture people. Just very vulgar, perverted. Every kind of perversion you can think of, Nero did. He was utterly mad. He even fell in love with a young boy and castrated him and turned him into a woman. I mean, I, I'm not even giving you the full story. This is just the beginning, but he was just so cruel. And, and we see with the persecution of, of Christians, it began with Nero. I mean, really it began with the Jews, but it began with Nero uh, predominantly. He wanted to build a temple and it was going to be a very uh, lavish, extravagant building, but he needed space for it. And so it's believed that it was actually Nero who caused the great fire of Rome because he wanted to clear the space. He was willing to kill people and just devastate the land so he could build his, his, his structure, which he did. But he had to find a scapegoat because he was being suspected. And so he blamed the Christians. He said, it's the Christians who were behind it. And thus began the persecution of Christians. 
because before that they were not being persecuted by Rome. They would actually have Christians burned and used as ca- living candles. The Emperor Nero was an arsonist, heavily suspected of causing the Great Fire of Rome. But in order to stave off public suspicion and a public lynching, Nero immediately accused the new sect called Christians. For burning the city, he rounded up Christians, wrapped them up in pitch, dipped them in tar, and burned them as torches for his dinner parties. Meanwhile, he and his guests would sit back and feast and relish this view of suffering Christians melting, burning, tormented before their eyes. And then Nero committed suicide in AD sixty-eight. Yes, and an interesting in Revelation, it hearkens to the scripture that says, "Those who live by the sword shall die by the sword." And Nero was known for beheadings. He loved to see beheadings. In fact, it was during the persecution by the Emperor Nero that the Apostle Paul was beheaded by a sword in sixty-four A.D. The scripture in Revelation thirteen ten seems to prophesy Nero's death. It states, "He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword." Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. He was known for beheadings, and he himself would die by the sword. He committed suicide. And he killed himself. Nero Caesar ruled from fifty four A D to sixty eight A D. Now, if you believe that the Book of Revelation was written before the destruction of Jerusalem, which we do, then it seems right that it was written during this time because in that era you don't have the ability to transmit information as quickly as we do. So it needed time for this message to go across. The Christians would have to prepare for the most catastrophic time in history, where first of all the persecution of Christians would begin under Nero, and then you would have, following Nero's death, there was a year called the year of the four emperors, where in one year they had four emperors. Can you imagine America having four presidents in one year? And it was an extremely unstable time. It looked like the empire would collapse, but then it revived again. Revelation thirteen three seems to prophesy about the revival of the wounded beast, the revival of the Roman Empire that seemed like it was about to collapse, but unexpectedly came back to life. Revelation thirteen three states, and I saw one of his heads. As it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. After that, we see Vespasian comes in; he revives the Roman Empire, and then we see the destruction of Jerusalem. So, three major tumultuous events are occurring. Upon further contemplation, I would say that there were actually four major upheavals during that time. Firstly, the persecution of Christians under Nero. Secondly, the death of the apostles Peter and Paul, which must have been absolutely devastating to the church, and this occurred in sixty-four A.D. Then we see the year of the four emperors occurred in sixty nine A.D. Finally, the destruction of Jerusalem in seventy A.D. Let's look at Revelation eleven one to two. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, "Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there." But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. 
I highly recommend Kenneth Gentry's books on this topic. He brings in many references. For example, T. Perry, who writes that Vespasian made war from roughly April 67 at Ptolemais until the fall of Jerusalem in September 70, a period of three and a half years. Three and a half years, that adds up to 42 months. Then he quotes M. Stewart, who observes that the active invasion of Judea continued almost exactly this length of time, being at the most only a few days more, so few that they need not and would not enter into a symbolical computation of time. Then you have M. Barker, who agrees that this figure represents the duration of the final struggle with Rome for Vespasian entered Galilee with his armies in the spring of 67 CE and Jerusalem fell 42 months later in September 70 CE. Thus we see that from the spring of AD 67 to August, September AD 70, the time of formal imperial engagement against Jerusalem is a period right at 42 months. Precisely as Revelation 11 prophesied. Those who argue for the later date of Revelation, if you look at it, it doesn't make sense because they say that this was written under Domitian, but Domitian was not intent on persecuting Christians. Even though Christians did get killed amongst many others, Domitian was focused on killing the elites. He had a different focus. Domitian was the emperor of Rome from 81 to 96 AD. His reign, though one of relative peace and stability, became engulfed in both fear and paranoia. His death would occur at the hands of those who were closest to him, bringing an end to his short dynasty. I want to look into this because this will help uncover the lies told about his rulership. Now, Domitian began as a good ruler, rebuilding Rome, restoring its ruins, taking care of the welfare of the people. And despite his own lack of moral values, he attempted to raise the standards of public morality. He forbade male castration. He admonished senators who practiced homosexuality and he came against incest. However, Domitian had a growing paranoia that conspirators surrounded him. He suspected those in his court and amongst the elites. This grew into such an obsession that he would have informers investigating potential threats to his rulership. He would take in prisoners and cut off their hands so they could not plot against him. He lined the gallery where he took his daily walks with highly polished moonstone so that it reflected everything behind him and he could keep an eye on potential assassins. Domitian was not focused on Christianity. Christians were not his enemies. Instead, he was obsessively weaning out anyone who was a threat to his emperorship. And his fears became a reality and he was assassinated by someone within his imperial court. What about the narrative that Domitian was a great persecutor of Christians? This is the common description of Domitian's rule today. However, some historians are uncovering that this was a fake news narrative. It was deliberately contrived. By who? Well, let's look first at the writings of Melito of Sardis, Tertullian, and Iranius. They were from the second century, fairly close to Domitian's reign. And they wrote that Domitian only slandered and exiled some Christians. And this was not evidence to claim any form of widespread persecution of Christians. So who was it who planted these false ideas? Where did it begin? You'll be surprised to hear this. It was Eusebius. I myself was stunned to discover that Eusebius, once again, was involved in fiddling with the truth. 
He took the writings of Melito, Tertullian, and Arrhenius, and he stretched them to add a new spin to their claims, developing the narrative that Domitian, like Nero, was also stirring up persecution against Christians. And through the passage of history, accuracy was lost, and this false narrative was taken to be true. And therefore, we have the picture of Domitian as the great persecutor of Christians. But this was a highly embellished spin on Domitian's reign. It cannot be substantiated with historical evidence. And yet it was used to support the later dating of the book of Revelation and thus support dispensationalism. Brian W. Jones observes that the tradition concerning Domitian's persecution persisted from a frail, almost non-existent basis, and yet it gradually developed and grew large. There's another biblical scholar I recommend. His name is Mark Wilson. He now lives in Turkey, and he has written about biblical Turkey. And he reveals how this false narrative of Christian persecution under Domitian stemmed from the claims of Eusebius. It's such a shame because Eusebius did so much good for the church, and yet he marred his legacy with his fabrications. If I could travel back in time and meet him, I would say, don't do it, Eusebius. Let the Lord take matters into his own hands because the kingdom of God does not need deception and lies to be established. It was Nero who had a distaste for Christianity. He loathed the Christians and he had a cruelty that was not seen amongst many emperors. The emperors were always known to be cruel. There was just something about the Roman Empire. It, it was built on bloodthirsty, power-hungry individuals. And Nero, I would say, with Caligula, was among the worst, if not the worst. So it seems to me, like, if you understand that the book of Revelation was written to prepare the people, prepare for the persecution that's coming, prepare for the toppling, the instability, and for the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and Jesus, in, in the Gospels, he tells the Christians to save yourselves when you see the abomination of desolation and flee to the hills. And they did. They flee to Pella, which is in Jordan. Another bit of evidence, and there's just so much in the book of Revelation for an early day, is the existence of a temple. If the book of Revelation was written in 95 AD, it seems impossible that there would be not even a hint or a shadow of a mention in the book of Revelation. This is the penultimate event in their lifetime. It was the end of the Le Levitical system. It was the end of Jerusalem, the end of this beautiful temple built by Herod. And Herod was an incredible architect. He, ga he gained the name Herod the Great for his architectural skills. How is it that if it really was written after the destruction of Jerusalem, there's not even one mention of this, this important event. John speaks of a temple that is, that is still standing. Meanwhile, you have dispensationalists who talk about the fact that this is a temple that will be built in the future. But it just doesn't make any sense because this, as I said, there's no mention of the destruction of the temple. Yeah, that's one reason why they believe that, that the Jews need to build a temple because of that scripture that's where John is told to measure the temple. So you think, oh, there has to be another temple built. There doesn't have to be another temple built because we're the temple. Yes. Okay. But, but Satan is always trying to like, He's always trying to come up with plans that he can make, try and fit scripture in a perverted way to, to confuse people. Mm, yeah. So I'm just going to give you two more points because I've been speaking for quite a while now. Okay. Now, in the book of Revelation, you'll see scriptures where the word of God seems to speak to all the earth. This is going to happen over all the earth and all the people of the earth. This word earth in Greek is G-E. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's written G-E. The word spelt G-E is pronounced gay. Listed in the Strong's Concordance as 1093, it means earth 
or land. Biblically, it has been used to refer to a region or land, such as the land of Israel, the land of Judah, the land of Zebulun, and so forth. Okay, that's the word that is used 67 times in Revelation. Every time you see the scriptures that all the earth and all the peoples of the earth and all the earth, and we assume it to mean the whole world. It does not mean the whole world. Gay. Means a region. There's a distinction. It's not used to mean the world. It means a local inhabited region. Biblically, it has only been used to refer to a region. It has been used to refer to the promised land or even to parts of the promised land, like the land of Judah. And then you see the word GE is used. It's important to note this distinction. There's an assumption that the verses in Revelation speak to the entire world, when in reality, the use of the word gay reveals that the message is being directed to a specific region or land. We assume that Revelation is a prophetic warning to the entire world, when in fact the Lord is addressing events that will occur in a specific region or land. With the events of 70 AD, we come to see that he is referring to the land of Jerusalem. For example, Revelation 13, 3, the KJV version surprisingly is less accurate in this instance because gay is translated to mean world. However, the accurate translation should read, and the lands wondered after. If you want to look at the word used for world, it's cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S. Cosmos is only used in the book of Revelation three times. So why is it that the predominant focus is on the region? It's because we're dealing with a local catastrophe, not a worldwide catastrophe. The scriptures make it very clear upon examination. Revelation 1.9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Apostle John declares himself both a brother and companion in the tribulation. He was speaking of the tribulation that was at hand, that was soon to come, that he himself would endure and live through along with the saints in Christ. Dispensationalists, however, consider the tribulation as a future event, but with the understanding that the book of Revelation was written at an early date and addressed to the generation living at the time, we see that the tribulation has already passed. Andreas of Caesarea the Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia summed it up perfectly. He wrote, Our Lord foretold the future events to the apostles who were asking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and about the end of time as much as they were able to receive. These things already happened in the siege of Vespasian and Titus to the Judeans who killed Christ just as Josephus, the Hebrew, narrates. All right, now I want to go into this. This is so fascinating. Revelation 1-4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So we see in the book of Revelation that he writes to the seven churches. Now we have we have interpreters taking this to bring in all kinds of abstract meanings. For example, the seven churches refer to seven ages, etc. But if you actually study it as it is, literally, he was addressing seven churches. <laughs> These were seven churches that existed. And the scripture tells John to send it to these churches. So he's being given clear and succinct instructions that this 
message must go to these churches. There's going to be a time of persecution. There's going to be a big uproar. Anyone who's in Jerusalem, head to the hills, get out. It's going to be destroyed. This is the preparation they're receiving. But why seven churches? The message is specific to the seven churches. This is important. If you look at the 95 AD uh, date, which is the date that dispensationalists stand on. Now, at that time, there were many more than seven churches in, in Asia, in Turkey. You will find even the New Testament refers to other churches in Asia that exist. For example, Troas. Acts 20, 5 to 12. There's another church in Asia. Why is why are they not included in the seven churches? At the later date, also, there, there are churches in Colosseum, Colossae, Turkey. And this is in uh, Colossians 1, 2. There are also churches in Hierapolis in 95 AD, Colossians 4 to 13. On top of that, there may also have been churches in Magnesia and Tralis, Turkey, because there are records that Ignatius was writing letters to them. So what about all these other churches? If this was written in 95 AD, why is John not addressing them? Some of them were big congregations. I'll tell you why. Because there's only one small window of time where there's exactly seven churches in Turkey. And that time was somewhere roughly around 64 AD to 70 uh -huh. AD. That's a good point. How do we know this? And I'm telling you, the, the Holy Spirit led me to this. Listen, Paul established nine churches, okay? Nine churches in Asia, in Turkey. To clarify this statement, by AD 60, nine churches had been successfully set up in Asia. Not all were set up directly by Paul, but were certainly the result of his ministry. These are the nine churches that existed in Turkey around AD 60. Ephesus, Tiatira, Smyrna, Philadelphia, Sardis, Laodicea, Pergamum, Colossae, Hierapolis. I also want to clarify that Ephesus was introduced to Christianity at a very early date. Apart from Antioch, Ephesus had one of the earliest known Christian communities. Why is this? Well, tradition teaches that Mary, the mother of Jesus, moved to Ephesus to escape being crucified herself. And it was the young apostle John who would escort her there. And he would also live in Ephesus because Jesus had entrusted him with Mary's care. Today, there are several historical landmarks in Ephesus named after Mary and John that seem to confirm that they indeed lived there. According to common Christian theory, the Virgin Mary and St. John arrived in Ephesus between 42 to 48 AD. And so the gospel was already being introduced there not very long after the Lord's crucifixion and resurrection. I mention this because the letter to the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation rebukes them for having lost their first love. This is appropriate because Ephesus was one of the earliest Gentile regions to be exposed to Christianity. On a side note, Tom and I visited what is said to be the Virgin Mary's home in Ephesus. And we also visited the beautiful grounds of the church in Ephesus that was led by both Paul and John. It was amazing. So when did the Apostle Paul arrive in Ephesus? He made his first visit to Ephesus in AD 51, and he himself began preaching there at this time. He returned again in AD 54 and officially sets up a church there, as seen in Acts 19. Ephesus was a bustling, thriving region, ideal for ministry, and he stayed in Ephesus for three years. With both Mary and John living there, it would have been an amazing alliance. And we see why Ephesus was such powerful ministry ground and why this was his longest stay of settled ministry. In fact, it's been said that this season in Ephesus 
may have been the most fruitful time in Paul's entire career. And so by roughly AD 60, along with various other developments, there were officially nine churches in Turkey. However, in AD 61, the cities of Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea were destroyed by an earthquake. And so two of the churches were not rebuilt. Only Laodicea was built shortly after. And so during the time from 64 AD to 70 AD, there were only seven churches. And this is the time where John the Apostle is writing to the seven churches of Turkey, of Asia. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Okay, and I have like so much more, but that's enough. I, I think that's enough to yeah. confirm quite a bit. It's a pretty good foundation for early writing of yeah. the book of Revelation. Yeah, so amen. Amen. <laughs> so that's it. So Our next Zoom meeting on the Revelation series will be on mystery Babylon. If you wish to join us, please email eventcardboardboxchurch at gmail.com or visit cardboardboxchurch.com and click on the events page. I hope this video blessed you. Please leave me a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. If you feel led to sow into this ministry, you can do so via these links, paypal, ahavasera at gmail.com, or you can use Zelle. Venmo or Cash App. God bless you richly.